Hello. My name is Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director at the Long Now Foundation. Um, about seven months ago, the uh, Pierre and Pamela Omidyar Foundation, uh, when we asked them for a grant, they asked us to have it matched by new membership. And um, we set ourselves a fairly ambitious goal of $100,000 in new memberships, not just renewals, um, in, um, in that seven months. And just uh, 20, the deadline for that was or is coming up tomorrow, Saturday night, and we just reached it earlier today. So I want to thank you all. And with that, I'll leave it up to Stuart to introduce Paul. Thank you very much. 1959, Paul. Uh, there was this assistant professor at Stanford. I was a biology major. I was studying the absolutely lowest status subset of biology there was in those days, which was ecology. And you know, all of the cool guys were going into molecular biology. We had Nobel Prize winners in the department, all that stuff. But uh, I was uh, hanging out with this guy who had a uh, Snoopy dancing around saying, I love butterflies, <laughs> on his door. And his job was to watch me watch tarantulas, which I was doing out at Jasper Ridge, which he's been helping protect ever since out behind Stanford. Biology is the language I was taught by Paul and others to think with. It's the best language I've ever learned. It is a way to understand not only biology, but I think everything that is interestingly complicated. That was made easier a couple of years later when a concept was co-invented by Paul and a botanist named Peter Raven. Uh, the concept was coevolution. And I was so charmed by the idea of coevolution, which is that organisms spend most of their time adapting not to the rocks and the climate change and stuff like that. They spend most of their time adapting to each other, who are busy adapting back, who are busy adapting back to those adaptations. And you get various convolutions and conflations of species who spend really exorbitant time and, and ingenuity figuring out complicated things they do with each other, and then it becomes its own package. Coevolution is such an interesting concept to conjure with that I wound up naming a magazine after it, Coevolution Quarterly. And that's the kind of thing, one among a great many, that my teacher Paul Ehrlich gave me, and he's here tonight to give you some. It, it's hard to believe, you know, that we go back 49 years and yet we're only 53 years old. I don't know how the hell it works. I'm looking at the audience here and I've discovered that the formality at Stanford doesn't carry over to San Francisco. So I'm going to get rid of this damn thing. <laughs> Ann and I named uh, this book that we're uh, flogging at the moment, uh, The Dominant Animal. And I thought a lot about that when we were giving the title. I, you know, should it be the dominant organism or the dominant critter or something like that? But I always remembered something, actually, you mentioned a Nobel laureate in our department. At that time, it was Josh Lederberg. And Josh said that the survival of humanity is not preordained. And what he was thinking about is that, indeed, uh, a virus or a bacterium could very well do all of us in. It's not impossible. And right now, <laughs> I have a virus that's trying to pull it off. So uh, <laughs> if I fade, faint, or anything else, uh, just excuse me. Uh, but what I'm going to try and do is give you a very brief overview of not just my view, but my view and that of the vast majority of my, all of my colleagues and the vast majority of ecologists, uh, and I think the vast majority now of biologists, about the state of the world. Uh, the, the genesis of this whole thing uh, actually goes to Stanford. One of the things that's annoyed me perpetually in my 49 years on the faculty there is that you can get all the way through Stanford University without having the slightest clue about how the world works. For example, we had a professor of computer, so you can do the same thing at Berkeley, by the way, uh, <laughs> at, at less cost. But the, uh, 
you can get, we had a professor of computer science who thought that milk was manufactured. And in fact, most people in both universities have no idea where their food comes from or what's involved uh, in producing it. Worse yet, <coughs> they don't have any real idea of where they came from, uh, what the history of our species is, how we became the dominant animal. And after all, if you think about it, uh, the last couple of centuries, the, the 19th and 20th centuries, we have taken over the world. We have first laced it with railroads, we have uh, cleared much of the land surface to grow crops, oh, we have then uh, laced it with highways, we filled the air with, uh, uh, with jet transports, and so on, uh, and really taken over the whole damn thing. Uh, there is, uh, right now, we farm something like 15% of the surface, 12% really, basically. And then there's another 3% that we built on. And then there's 25% roughly that we graze, often intensively. I was just in South Africa, and you should see some of the areas, for instance, Zululand, where there's not a blade of grass longer than that. Uh, and uh, another 30% are forests that we exploit, and the other remaining 30% uh, is mostly under ice or so high in the mountains that we haven't managed to do much with it yet. Uh, every cubic centimeter of the biosphere, the area occupied by life, has already been modified uh, by Homo sapiens. Uh, we have, we now mobilize minerals, which are important parts of ecosystems for industrialized society, uh, at rates higher in general than they're mobilized by natural processes uh, of erosion. Uh, we, as you may have heard, are altering the composition of the atmosphere, not necessarily to our benefit. Uh, we have spread novel chemicals all over the entire planet, and some of them have characteristics uh, that don't bode particularly well uh, for us. So there's not much question uh, that we dominate the planet, and we've dominated it, uh, uh, we've gained that dominance, for a series of reasons that we partially understand. I wouldn't tell you that science knows exactly where we came from and why and everything that happened, but what I'd like to do now is at least briefly, I'm gonna set the bezel on my watch because Stuart said I cannot talk more than three hours and I don't wanna run a minute over. Uh, but uh, how do we get to be the dominant animal? What, what do biologists know about that now? Well, one of the ways we got to be the dominant animal is we arranged for that, that asteroid or that comet to hit the planet, wipe out the dinosaurs. If we hadn't wiped out the dinosaurs, we wouldn't be here tonight. It would be Velociraptor t talking to you uh, and a, a very different system. Uh, but instead of being tiny little things that ran around and fed on dinosaurs' eggs, uh, we've made it to the top. And the general thought is that our, uh, something that was very much like one of our earliest mammalian ancestors is a tarsier, which you have a picture of here. Uh, I have seen tarsiers in the wild, except have any of you ever gone to Africa and tried to see a, uh, uh, a meerkat or something like that? You know, they're always running. You can never see, get a really good look at them. Well, that's the way the tarsiers are. They live in bushes. Uh, and they grab insects, but they move around very, very rapidly, part of their uh, defense. But what happens if you live in bushes or trees and you eat insects? Well, two things that are very important in retrospect for our dominance. First of all, your eyes tend to rotate around to the front of your head, so you get good binocular vision. And then you have digits that are able to grab things like insects. You, got, you can judge distance, you can grab things, that's wonderful and that's important because if we had eyes on the side of our head, we'd have a, had a hard time making stone tools and things like that or even making computers. Uh, and uh, if we didn't have the fingers, again, tough job. So it was important we went up in the trees for a while. Uh, it was also important, of course, that we came down because if you're gonna become a dominant animal on the planet, it's really hard to do things like practice agriculture, without which we couldn't have huge populations, uh, or mine minerals and so on and so forth. The trees are a pretty limited, uh, uh, a pretty limited environment. And as many of you know, the general thought is that climate change in Africa uh, brought the, uh, the, the chimps were, and, the, and, the, uh, and our ancestors were partially terrestrial, and as it dried out, our ancestors went out onto the savannas uh, and began uh, to live fully terrestrially. Uh, one of the interesting things, let's see, nope, wrong one. I'm totally incompetent at anything technological. Uh, there, there, and, and I, by the way, I have to be very careful 
because somebody was going to stand here and catch me if I fell off the stage when I tried to use this, but he's chickened out. He saw how big I was. I stay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one, one of the things to remember about us, which we don't understand why it happened, is we became bipedal before we got big brains. That was the first step, and there's still a lot of controversy about exactly where and when, but we know for sure uh, that the Australopithecines were bipedal, and there were probably earlier ones that were bipedal as well. So the earliest human beings uh, were upright, small-brained uh, hominids, and I call them human beings because we have to. In other words, it, you cannot have, for example, a president of the United States who's not a hominid. And so you've got to define anything that's upright and has a small brain as a hominid, right? So uh, the, we don't really know why our brains expanded so much so rapidly. You'll notice that they were chimp-like until you got through the Australopithecus, and then suddenly, suddenly in evolutionary time, and remember, although this is about three million years here, evolutionary time is generation time, and we're sort of a long generation organism. You know, fruit flies have 12 days or something, but human beings have 20 years to a generation, or 25. Uh, and so, in a relatively short time, our brains really expanded rapidly. Nobody knows for sure why. There's a lot of argument, for instance. Uh, it certainly has to do with our sociality, uh, the fact that we uh, are empathetic and we have a theory of mind as chimps do and so on, all ties in there. The biggest mystery because of the lousy recordings is when languages with syntax actually developed. And there are two general views of this. One is it was going on fairly steadily, maybe from Homo habilis to today, you know, from back in, I can't really see this, but it doesn't matter, from back in this region to today. Some people, including my colleague Richard Klein, who is brilliant and who a lot of this is based on things actually it may have happened very, very suddenly uh, 50,000, 60,000 years ago that the grunts suddenly we be, became, uh, we developed syntax. Whichever it was, there's no question that the thing that separates us most clearly from all other organisms is language with syntax. As you know, there are lots of other organisms that use tools uh, and lots of other organisms that get laid, but uh, <laughs> language with syntax really does distinguish us. Uh, from the other, uh, uh, the other organisms. And um, I'm going to go to the next slide. The last slide was genetic evolution. That is no question, for instance, that the expansion of our brains was tied for whatever reason into our ability uh, of some, organ some of us to outreproduce others. There was natural selection was functioning there. Our genome was changing uh, very rapidly. Uh, but Fairly early on, about two and a half million years ago, uh, about the time of Homo habilis, we began to leave the first signs of our culture. Now, culture, which is non-genetic information, which is passed on from generation to generation, uh, is not unique to human beings. Uh, but in quantity, it's unique. In other words, we have a scale of culture unknown in any other organism. Chimps have culture, some birds have culture, that is, again, non-genetic information that's passed on from generation to generation. But one of the things we, although we have a very nice picture of how evolution occurred genetically, we still don't, there's no, not yet been a Darwin for cultural evolution. We know a lot about it, but we don't really understand the mechanisms, we don't really know how to change it. For instance, if if you have a problem with, a, with an antibiotic, for instance, and you're getting resistance to it, it's evolving, uh, a, a geneticist can tell you what to do about it. Uh, but if you have a problem like a small-brained president uh, and you want to know how to do something about it, there's no cultural evolution that can say, ah, oh, the thing you have to do is X, Y, and Z uh, to change it. And I'll come back to that because I think the biggest problem humanity is facing today uh, is fundamentally uh, a behavioral problem uh, where we don't know uh, how uh, actually to go about changing it. It's a problem in cultural evolution, and if I have any time in the last uh, hour and a half, I'll hit on that. This, the thing to notice here, though, uh, is that culture evolved at a very slow rate at first and then accelerated. Uh, notice this, this is not a linear scale. You know, it's two and a half million years ago and 50,000 years ago. So the first, the, the, the Olduan toolkit uh, was around for a vicinity of 800,000 years, followed by the Acheulean, which was a, uh, over a million years. 
Uh, and they went the, the very slow cultural change. Now, there may have been other cultural changes in records that haven't been left, but nonetheless, this is a fairly good picture of uh, an accelerating rate of change, and it really picked up about 50,000 years ago. Another big controversy about the big leap forward. Jared Diamond may have talked to some of you about this at one time or another. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you think that just 50,000 years ago we were still concentrating on stone tools and bone needles, and then imagine uh, if you were an anthropologist coming to the remains of Earth, say, 10,000 years from now, and you uh, had only the historical record that you got by excavating, and you excavated uh, a site from, say, 1300 AD and a site from today, what would you assume? You would have assumed that organisms of an entirely different genus had made these things. In other words, the difference between the culture the artifacts, the non-genetic information which was possessed by people uh, in 1300 is just incredibly different from today, whereas here you could take people uh, sites a million years apart and imagine it's exactly the same organism. So uh, cultural evolution has been accelerating at an incredible rate, and unfortunately we don't understand about it uh, as much as we'd like to. Uh, people have always, certainly, uh, for the last 50,000 years, there's not been any significant change in the brain power of human beings. There's no sign of that at all. <clears throat> and some of our ancestors, as we know from the archaeological record, uh, did things the way some very recent people did. This is a picture I took many years ago in the Arctic, uh, uh, before I went to Stanford, of an, a, an Inuit showing me how they uh, drove uh, huge herds of caribou over cliffs by setting up what they call the Inukshuk, which simply means a pile of stones that looks like a person. Very small groups, but they would herd the caribou uh, towards a funnel of these cairns. This is a, a model of one. It would stand about human size. Sometimes they had arms on them of rocks sticking out. And they would have children and women behind the uh, every other third or fourth cairn waving blankets. And the caribou would go down either into a lake where they could be speared from kayaks or over a cliff where they'd be killed. And we know that that's exactly how a great deal of the megafauna was wiped out in both North America and in Europe uh, by our ancestors, uh, you know, 15, 20,000 years ago. So we have this problem of what got us going in certain directions after we had developed to the point where we were smart social animals with language, uh, with language. Uh, Many people think that the big move was the agricultural revolution, and there's no question at all, that's, we're talking now 10,000, 8,000 years ago, uh, in about six or seven places around the globe, people settled down and began uh, to practice agriculture. There's no question at all we wouldn't be here tonight if they hadn't done it, because what agriculture did, uh, basically, as it says there, uh, don't you love people who show you slides and then read the lines to you as if you'd never learned to read. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I put it on to remind me, but of course the position I'm standing, I can't read it, so it doesn't make any difference at all. But agriculture at, allowed people to produce more food than they personally needed, which allowed for specialization in the society. And that's the start of something that I call, uh, I, which I think is really important, uh, the cultural gap. Uh, when I was with the Inuit, uh, each individual knew essentially the whole culture of the society. Now, there were different jobs. Uh, that, uh, for instance, it was men who crouched over the, the brief breath hole of the seal in the ice for hours waiting for the seal to stick its head up and spear it. But the women knew how it was done. It wasn't a secret. There may have been a few secret things that the shaman knew and so on, but basically everybody knew how everything worked and how the society was organized. And if you think about it, it's gone on and on to the point where there isn't an individual in this audience, not an individual in this country, who possesses one millionth of the non-genetic information that our society possesses. None of us come close. You know, we have 25,000 genes, but a, a 747 has millions of parts. Each part is essentially a piece of non-genetic information. So one of the things that's happened to humanity, and I think it really has consequences for us, is this enormous gap has grown where each person can at most have a grasp of the smallest part uh, of our non-genetic information. I admit, I don't know how the damn television set works. 
I know if I push on a button, it lights up, but that's about the limit of it. I know the electrons racing around in there. But, and my friends who are physicists mostly couldn't build a television set. It's not that, you know, that, that there's some area of special expertise. So uh, there is a big culture gap. The next big step after agriculture was probably writing. We had our language with syntax, but we were dependent on memory, basically, for passing our culture on. When you start writing, then you're no longer dependent on memory. Things can be passed around impersonally, and so on. Uh, and then came Mr. Gutenberg, blessedly for those of us who are authors, because it's just hell to copy all those books out by hand. Uh, and that, of course, opened the culture gap. That was one of the big steps in opening the culture gap. And then, of course, came the Industrial Revolution, moving us towards dominance once again. Uh, and, of course, one of the really big moves there you may have heard of is that we started using solar energy that had been gathered in the past uh, and stored away uh, in the form of coal and peat coal, uh, petroleum, and natural gas. Another gigantic step, and one that we're beginning to pay a very high price for. And you combine these, and there's a nice picture for mobilizing minerals. I mentioned how much we do. The size of some of these open pit mines is absolutely stunning, to say the very least. So we are dominant. There you are. There's a lot of non -gen much more non-genetic information in that than in anybody in this room. Well, I don't know, maybe one of you has as much, but. Uh, all right. So how do we get to be dominant? Some things we know about. We're very smart. Uh, we're very social. Uh, we have developed this incredible technological evolution that has nothing to do with our genetics. Uh, or, by the way, if you think you were driven to come here tonight to hear me because of your genes, forget it. There is a, uh, a sort of mythology promoted by the New York Times and Nick Wade, I think, more than anybody else, that uh, most of our everyday behavior is controlled by uh, our genes. You know that. Uh, women have genes for low necklines uh, and for admiring men who drive fast cars uh, and on and on and on, or the people, as one of my colleagues used to say, are uh, color-coded for genetic quality. Uh, that was a Mr. Shockley, an idiot who used to teach at Stanford. Uh, an idiot Nobel laureate who used to teach at Stanford, <laughs> I might say. Uh, but basically, the essence of all this is our cultural evolution. That's how we got to be dominant on the planet. Otherwise, we'd be chimp-like and about as dominant as the chimps are today. How many of you ever seen chimps in the wild? I'm curious. You know, a few. They're, they're really interesting critters. Uh, has anybody seen bonobos? That's my last ambition, but they're in such dangerous places and they're so endangered. Bonobos, by the way, uh, are the apes we should be imitating. Our big mistake is going chimp-wise. Bonobos settle all of their disputes by genital rubbing, and I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's the coming phase. Uh, okay. Um, so we became dominant, but of course, as all of you know, part of the story is that there's a cost to this dominance. And the cost to the dominance is uh, that we are without thinking about it, destroying our life support systems. And that's not a great idea. Uh, the, the genius that brought us to where we are uh, is now threatening our very existence. Am I in the, if I move over here, am I out of the TV light? I, the, the TV lights are very bright. So I should stay, stay here. Okay, I'll look down. Uh, the, uh, uh, the dominance is, is, I think, hopefully all of you realize, threatening our very existence. Uh, and the reason is that we are destroying the natural systems of the planet that support us. If you ever hear, as I just saw the other day in the paper, somebody saying in England that, you know, the, the economic situation is so bad that we've got to forget about the environment. That's like saying, you know, that, that your hair is falling out so rapidly that you don't want to worry about your heart disease. Uh, the, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the natural systems of the planet. They give us what are called ecosystem services, which again, you can get all the way through Stanford without ever hearing the term. By the way, you can hear it by going to the course which I teach. Uh, but you can't get that course required. You can get all the way through Stanford 
without basically knowing anything at all about science, even though science is and technology are at least half of our culture by any definition. Uh, so an ecosystem service is simply something like uh, control of water flows, maintenance of the quality of the, uh, the gaseous quality of the atmosphere, pollination of crops. They, in the United States, that supplies something on the order baseline estimate of about $17 billion a year besides making our, uh, our diet much better. Control of the natural control of the pests of our crops. If we didn't have that natural control of the pests, we wouldn't be eating because we can't control crop pests if we eat, no matter what we try with pesticides without killing ourselves unless we have the backup of the natural controls uh, on, uh, on crop pests. Uh, recycling of the nutrients that are absolutely essential to agriculture and forestry, uh, supplying food from the sea, less all the time, but, uh, or less quality all the time, but still supplying it. Those ecosystem services are without, they're, they're invaluable. We cannot exist without them, and yet they are what we are attacking at the moment uh, at an enormously and increasing level. Uh, it's normally discussed in terms of a little formula called the IPAT equation, which simply says the impact that a society has on its life support systems is the function of three very general things that multiply together. One's already illustrated up there, the number of people you have. Curiously enough, the more people you have, uh, the more impact you're going to have on your life support systems. Uh, the second thing uh, is, of course, how each person behaves. Uh, a, uh, a group of, uh, shall we say, uh, people who are subsistence farmers and uh, don't use fossil fuels at all and so on are going to have less impact per person than Beverly Hills millionaires, curiously enough. Uh, so you have to not just look at the people off and say, well, uh, the real population problem in the world is those Indians. There's more than a billion of them, you know, and that's really bad. But when you look at how people behave, the most serious population problem in the world is right here in the good old USA, where we have 302 million people. We're the third largest country in the world in numbers. But when you multiply in our consumption habits, we outdo everybody else uh, at, a, at an enormous level. We're the most overpopulated nation in the world. Interestingly enough, with 302, billion people, uh, 302 million people in the US, no one has ever come up with even a semi-sane idea for why we should have more than 140 million Americans alive at one time. And the idea for why we should have 140 million Americans alive at one time is national defense, because that's the number we had at the time we, <coughs> we won uh, the Second World War. Now, of course, anybody who's nutty enough to think that brute numbers adds to your defense just has never thought about, say, the Arabs and the Israelis or what a military uh, power India is, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, that is a semi-sane reason. Excuse me, I need a little gin at this point because <laughs> I'm fading. Ah, that's rejuvenating. Uh, so, and then, of course, besides having the, the affluence factor, IPAT, population times affluence times technology, you also have to ask what kind of technology and economic and social systems uh, supply, uh, supply the affluence, so that if what you're trying to supply in the form of affluence uh, is transportation. I have a very high, uh, um, I have a very wonderful transportation system for getting to work every day. One of the reasons I've stayed at Stanford is I can walk to work and walk home, and it's absolutely wonderful. If I drove an SUV to work and back home, then my, the technology factor on my impact would obviously be very much higher. Uh, so, let me talk a little bit about the things that are affecting the IPAT equation right now. Uh, I can actually say something cheery on the population front, and that is uh, in the last 30 years, roughly, we've learned an awful lot about how to change human reproductive behavior, and it's actually been changed over a lot of the planet. Not far enough, but it's been changed. The, the, the nicest thing is it's one of those win-win situations because the the most important thing to do if you want to reduce birth rates is to give rights and opportunity to women. Curiously enough, uh, if you do that, birth rates come down. It's been done over a lot of the planet. Birth rates have come down in Europe, Japan, even to a degree in the United States, although we're still of the, of the uh, super-consuming countries uh, about the worst. 
But uh, so we have seen changes. And uh, now the projections are that if we're lucky, that is, if we don't have a huge die off, or if reproductive behavior doesn't change in the wrong direction, a will level population size off somewhere around uh, probably 9 billion to 10 billion people around the end of, uh, of the next century. That's good news. The bad news is, of course, that if we go to 10 billion, you're adding more than one and a half times the number of people that were alive when I was born. In other words, adding 3 billion more people to the planet. We're about 6.8 now. Uh, adding 3 billion more people to the planet uh, is not only a gigantic number of people, but what you got to remember is their impact everything else being equal is going to be much greater than the last three and a half billion people. Why is that? People are smart. Again, we're a smart animal. We became, dom uh, we became dominant. We didn't become dominant by starting to farm the most marginal land first and to smelt the half percent uh, copper ores that were lying around on the surface. Uh, uh, what we did was we smelted the one, you know, we, did, we got the copper that didn't need smelting. Uh, we farmed the richest lands first. We got the easy water sources first. So every person that you add uh, generally needs to have water transmitted for, tr transported further and treated more, uh, fuels transported further, uh, and farm, a land farm that's more marginal and requires more use of fertilizers and so on. In other words, there's this disproportionate impact of population growth uh, that gets worse and worse as you go on. So that's the bad side of the population story. Uh, but it's nowhere near as complicated as the, uh, as the bad side of the consumption story because we haven't really even begun to tackle the issue of the consumption, of the affluence. Look, we're having the, the economy staggering in various ways. What do the idiot politicians say? Well, the way to cure this is to consume more. Go out and buy another SUV, buy another refrigerator. What is the consumer uh, spending is the big thing that keeps our society rolling, right? And so the pressure is all to increase consumption unless you understand what's happening to the world. I have, I'll come back to my recent incident on the consumption front. Uh, we have, if you look at the statistics on fisheries, for example, you'll see that we've barely managed to keep the yield up by more and more fish farming, which has terrible ecological consequences, but the fish you're getting are lower and lower quality. If you look at the top three or four fishes that were caught per decade, you see things like swordfish being replaced by things that used to be trash fish. I used to, be, I used to say that one way to tell what the state of the fisheries was to see how many of the fishes you were offered in a restaurant were blackened. You know, when you blacken a fish, it doesn't, you know, it's like blackening a shoe sole. Uh, a, a shoe sole. Uh, <laughs> you can't taste the fish, uh, and so you can use any kind of fish in a blackening exercise or in a fish and chips uh, exercise. So the fisheries uh, are a, a very obvious place uh, where uh, things have been going down the drain, and they've been going down the drain uh, for quite some time. There's, there's a recent summary of the state of the fisheries, but it actually... Uh, doesn't show you how bad things were because all the recent data coming in and the studies that have been shown is that the baseline was wrong. That actually, they take it from a baseline, say, of around uh, 1880, uh, and by that time, two thirds of the big fishes were already gone. And so, we, we, at times, you used to be able to, they used to say you could walk from Maine to New Newfoundland on the backs of the cod. Uh, the numbers are uh, horrifying to what we've, what we've done to the oceans. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but of course, the thing that attracts most people's attention now on the environmental front is uh, what's happening, uh, the so-called global heating problem. I want to say two sort of contradictory things about it. I think, and all of my colleagues think, this is an extraordinarily serious problem, possibly, quite possibly civilization ending. The conservative view of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change can be said to be roughly this, that there's about a 10% chance we'll get away with it. If we were living on Tuvalu Atu, we've already not gotten away with it. But by that I mean that uh, people in this room are not going to directly suffer from climate change to any significant degree. Uh, and again, that's changing pretty fast too. There is on the other end of the probability spectrum about a 10% chance uh, that civilization will end, that because of uh, uh, the 
battles over, uh, uh, over resources because of starvation and countries that are starving having nuclear weapons and so on, that the whole thing will just go down the drain. And the other 80% of the probability is spread in between and nobody can be sure. That's the conservative about four or five years ago IPCC estimate. All of the data coming in since tend to suggest that that's much too optimistic. That in fact, uh, the positive feedbacks, which are what you don't want, remember negative feedbacks like a thermostat, the more you produce, the more it gets damped down. Uh, positive feedbacks, the more you produce, the even more you produce. Uh, and for instance, the fact that the Arctic ice is melting, people say, who cares whether the Arctic ice melts? Well, what happens when the Arctic ice melts? It turns out ice reflects a lot of solar energy back into space. It's got high reflectance. Ocean absorbs it. And so the more ocean, the more tundra and so on you have, relative to the amount of ice you have, the, heat, the hotter the planet gets. And so there's a very important positive feedback uh, that tends to indicate that, the, uh, that the, uh, the earlier estimates were in the wrong direction. The, uh, there, uh, the IPCC works on a very slow scale, is extremely conservative because, of course, its results have to be approved by Saudi Arabia and oil companies. Uh, and so uh, I think it'd be very silly to depend on it. And really important scientists like Steve Schneider and, and uh, uh, Jim Hansen, who you may have seen in the papers the other day, are saying, got to get back to something like 350 parts per million if we're going to have a chance. Uh, and we're going in exactly the opposite direction at an increasing rate. We're putting more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, not less. Another problem with the, the popular view of the, um, uh, of the global heating problem uh, is that the big issue is sea level rise. Relax. Except if you're in an extraordinary place or extraordinary circumstances, you'll be able to outwalk it. You won't even have to run as the sea comes up. <laughs> What's going to happen, of course, and it already seems to be happening, is that the distribution of rainfall is going to change. Guess what depends on the distribution of rainfall? Agriculture. Where we get our food, either through an irrigated system, which produces disproportionately more than non-irrigated systems, or rain-fed, but you've got to have water, and we're going to be changing the distribution of water. Now, that may not sound so bad, but it's not going to be a redealing of the cards. Some places are going to get wetter, some places are going to get drier. We're in training probably something approaching a millennium of continual change in our, uh, our patterns of water, of precipitation, which means, of course, that our very expensive water infrastructure is going to have to be continually changed. Uh, as Stuart and I were talking before uh, the, uh, the meeting here, um, California is a hydraulic civilization. Where does, where's our main water supply? Where is it stored? Somebody knows. Snowpack in the Sierra. What happens if the snowpack disappears? A lot of the 33 million Californians are going to go somewhere else. I don't know where, but they're going to have to go somewhere else. Same thing in the Andes. Lima depends entirely uh, for its water on glaciers in the Andes, which are disappearing. Worse yet, South Asia is utterly dependent for its water on the glaciers in the, uh, uh, in the Himalayas, which are melting. Uh, and so uh, the, the problems that can be induced by, uh, by climate change are horrendous. And we're running this gigantic experiment to see what happens. And there are still people paid by, among others, some oil companies to try and fool people about this. Uh, there was recently, you may have seen in the paper, the suggestion that they ought to be sued the same way that the tobacco industry was sued for lying to people about, uh, uh, about the effects of smoking. Same kind of lying has been going on now at a high rate and very well documented uh, for at least two decades uh, by the Western Fools Association and other uh, industry groups designed to, I mean, you can read their own literature. The whole idea is to make it uncertain, to put uncertainty in, to make people unsure that the science doesn't prove it. Well, science never proves anything. But I think all you have to do is read the newspapers to see what's happening on the climate change front. This may not be our most serious environmental problem. That's the horrible thing, and I'll come back to some of the others. Uh, well, what did you want? You didn't come here to be cheered up, did you, for Christ's sake? Uh, toxification of the planet, maybe it's related to consumption, of course, 
crap we put on our farm fields and our big monocultures, but toxification may be a worse problem. Why? Uh, and I'm not sure, yes or no, but we've spread toxic substances all over the planet. And at least with climate change, we've got crackpot ideas for what to do if we don't get the greenhouse gas emissions down. We're going to dump billions of tons of iron filings in the southern oceans. We're going to put sunshades between us and the sun. We're going to have the battleship Missouri shooting aerosols into the atmosphere, you know, five shots a minute for the next 200,000 years, that sort of thing. Now, these are nutty. They're truly nutty. But at least, you know, people can think about what you might possibly do. By the way, most of them don't do anything at all for the acidification of the oceans that comes from the carbon dioxide. In other words, you don't want to think of the greenhouse gases as only having the effect of changing the, the, uh, uh, the, the way the heat is transferred in the, uh, uh, in the atmosphere. But with the toxics, what do you do? Get your graduate students out there with forceps to pull the molecules back out of the world, the DDT that's in the uh, uh, Arctic ice cap, in the, in the Arctic ice, and in the Antarctic ice, and so on. And some of the things we're releasing in quite large quantities uh, are things that don't have a standard dose response curve. The, the, one of the things that's wrong with our regulations is the assumption is always made uh, that the more of a chemical you have are exposed to, the worse the effects. But there are a lot of things, particularly things that mimic hormones, where that can be exactly reversed. That the smaller amounts are much more deadly, and it's because it has a way, it, it depends on how the receptors that are affected are upregulated or downregulated. And there are many substances, if you're exposed to very small parts, you get really nasty results. And you don't get those results if you're exposed to big doses. Now, you may, how many of you know the story of bisphenol A? Just curious, a few of you, all right. But this, this, I think, shows how Linnaeus misnamed this Homo sapiens, the smart man. That was the original name. What smart man would work very hard to develop a synthetic hormone uh, to use in things like birth control pills, estrogen, and uh, find out it's not quite powerful enough to use in the pills, so you put it into the plastic of baby bottles so it leaches into the baby's milk. Very, not very homo sapient, is it? But almost all these hard plastic sports bottles are giving you all a dose of hormones, which may actually be more effective at small doses than large. We don't know. So when I say that um, the problem of toxification may be worse, there are these weird signs, for instance, in subarctic villages, in some places now, there are twice as many girl babies born as boy babies. And there are stories of, I shouldn't say stories, there are reports of decline in uh, sperm viability in men. That there's a move towards less, uh, less viable sperm. Now, the, these are very controversial, but the point is, when you start dosing everybody with weird hormones in combinations, you have no idea what the effects are going to be. If you find out one of them is really bad, there's not even a crackpot scheme to come up with to cure it. You can't get rid of it. It's all over the environment. We are releasing thousands and thousands of chemicals into the environment where we have, no, we have little idea of their direct effect on human beings, no idea of their effect on other organisms, and no ideas of their, uh, of their synergistic, possible synergistic effects, one way, two way, three way, n minus one over uh, n times n minus one over two ways. In other words, you have a lot of interactions if you have 10,000 chemicals out there, no way you can test them. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, obviously, some of these things we need to do. In other words, what kind of society we have, you can't avoid letting some stuff out into the environment. But you sure as hell can avoid putting synthetic hormones into your plastics that they're going to leak out of. Uh, it's like the issue of, uh, and some of you will disagree with me, no doubt, but of animal experimentation. I think I'd much rather have uh, a surgeon who trained on a dog uh, operating on my granddaughter's heart than a surgeon who learned it on a computer. Okay? That's my personal view. But I think there's no excuse at all for taking rabbits, cutting off their eyelids, and testing the toxicity of mascara on them. And there was a difference between an open heart operation for a kid uh, and the safety of mascara, which I'm told you can actually live without. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, so basically, 
we're, we're dumping all kinds of crap that we don't necessarily have to. We don't have a high enough standard for what you ought to, what might be safe enough to release because you get such a huge benefit from it that the risk can be written off and so on. We don't really think about these things systematically, which I think is a very bad idea. I'm blabbering on. I better get moving. Uh, like Ann and I, when, when we were courting in Lawrence, Kansas, unbelievable place. It's absolutely, well, it's not absolutely flat, but intellectually it is, uh, the, uh, or was. We go to a passion pit. How many of you are old enough to remember what a passion pit is? Hey, there are a few of us here. A drive-in movie. It used to be able, used to be able to go to the movies in your car and not get out of the car, and you could do all kinds of other interesting things in the car when the movie got really dull, right? Well, when we were, when we were doing this in the, in the, in the, 1950, in the uh, 1950s, they'd come around with something like that and blast it in your car window to keep the mosquitoes down. You know, <laughs> DDT or some other wonderful compound uh, that you didn't have to worry about. And now DDT is over the entire planet. I don't have to give you the, the routine on toxic waste or uh, uh, to move on from toxification. Another thing we do besides toxifying the planet is moving organisms all over the planet without worrying about the consequences. That's a picture of the vine that ate the south. I don't know if you know about kudzu, but there's just lots and lots of problems created by just carrying things around, curious enough, another big environmental problem. Uh, and, you know, I want to keep the cheer going here, so <laughs> naturally I move right on to the Black Death. But, again, one of the things we're not preparing for, we're actually moving in the wrong direction on, is the, uh, the epidemiological environment. Think about it for a minute. What controls the chance of getting vast epidemics, particularly of novel pathogens? Well, one is how many people you have. First of all, the novel pathogens are all things that are generated normally, or I shouldn't say all, mostly, generated in other organisms. Uh, so the things like Marburg virus and uh, AIDS and so on came as transfers from natural hosts into us. Now, the more people you have, the more people are pressed into contact with the natural hosts. The more people you have, the better the chance that a transfer will actually occur and will take. Uh, and the more people you have, the better the chances the disease will become established in human beings. For instance, uh, if you, you can't have measles permanently uh, in a city of less than 50,000 people. And the reason is that everybody either dies or becomes immune and the disease dies out. You've got to have big populations to support many pathogens. Well, we have, guess what, huge population, biggest we've ever had on the planet. Second thing uh, that we have is very large numbers, well, probably at least a billion people who are immune compromised because they don't have adequate diet, at least down to the micronutrient level. Then what have we added to this? Very rapid transport systems. Uh, think about it, if a plague ship left Japan bound for India, nobody in India got plagued because everybody died or became immune on the ship long before it got to India. Whereas there was one uh, steward who infected people with AIDS on four continents in one week. Uh, so we have very rapid transport systems uh, added into the whole picture. And then, of course, for bacterial diseases, we're disarming ourselves because we have so misused antibiotics that even the antibiotic now of last resort, vancomycin, people are showing, uh, strains are showing up that, uh, of various bacteria that are resistant to vancomycin. So we're disarming ourselves at the same time. There's no programs in any government that I know of really adequately stacking antiviral medicines. There are no programs for quarantine. For instance, when I got scarlet fever when I was a kid, they put a big sign on the door of the house, quarantine. My parents couldn't go anywhere, nobody could come in, and so on. We should be prepared at the national level, at the local level, and so on, for quarantines. We don't have enough hospital beds. Uh, a, another viral plague like the uh, flu in 1918, 1919, which killed more people than the First World War, uh, is a real possibility with even bigger results in a larger population with much more rapid transport and so on. So uh, another thing that we should be worrying about that we're not, we actually have been uh, defunding the CDC pretty much over time, uh, is uh, uh, there. And I just, I came back uh, from, Ann and I were in Southern Africa, as I mentioned last week, very few days ago. 
And uh, one of our colleagues, somebody that Stuart knows also, uh, teaches there in the University of Pretoria. And he's trying to develop capacity in biology and conservation and so on uh, in African students. And he says he'll have this wonderful class of really bright, eager students. And he realizes that 25% of them are going to be dead in a few years. In other words, the, rate, the level of AIDS infection is absolutely horrifying. There is a little good news on that front, if true, uh, that there has been a decline in new infections. But Africa is in deep, deep trouble. And of course, it's, the, there's going to be a lag time in seeing the results. And one of the true, but a lot of, Africa is a very sad place. We ran to a lot of people from Zimbabwe, which is being ruined by a single person. And I have a graduate student working now in Kenya, and Stuart and I, Anne, have all spent time in Kenya, a wonderful country that's been driven under by a relatively few people, in, in, insanely, actually. So, and the president in South Africa isn't a big help uh, on the AIDS front. So. Uh, I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic about what will happen in Africa, except the people are wonderful. It's a wonderful continent. Well, and then, of course, we have the problem in our consumption area uh, uh, about, about resource wars, because we're in the middle of the first big one uh, now. The, the, the first short one, of course, was the Israeli-Arab War over water in 1967, if you know the history of it. If you don't, it's in, it's in the book. But um, the one we have now uh, goes back to the time when Churchill decided to switch the Royal Navy to oil. Uh, and that was the time that the, then the British, the French, the Russians, and as latecomers, the United States, divided up the Middle East and made countries on the basis of oil deals. The Bulgobankian Agreement, the Red Line Agreement, all that stuff, which some of our government people never heard of before they uh, decided to try and get their hands on Iraq's oil. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, my colleague Gretchen Daly, I think, summarized it very well when all of us, I think probably most of the people in this room, were arguing against uh, the idea of invading Iraq to get its oil. She said, do you suppose that we'd be planning to invade Iraq uh, if their major export were broccoli? And it turns out, <laughs> probably not. Uh, but it just came out, I mean, finally the New York Times which has had this long slumber on the Iraq war. You know, remember, they were big promoters of it. Slowly came out and admitted the other day that it's all for oil. Uh, of course, uh, what's his name? The head of the, uh, the, the ex-head of the uh, uh, SEC um, admitted it long before that. What's his name? Come on, somebody. Um, Greenspan. Greenspan, yeah, Greenspan. See, when you get old enough, your synapses just disappear. Uh, yeah, well, of course, oil was a big factor in the First and Second World War. We fought over it in both of those wars. Uh, here, here's a nice sign of when you're thinking about why it's so wonderful to have 302 million Americans. The American press did not mention, as far as I could determine, one word about the downside of having 302 million people. We were congratulating ourselves for having going over 302 million. I'm reminded of the old saying, you know, you should never worry about the population being too small because it can be enlarged by unskilled labor that loves its work. Uh, and <laughs> there, there's U.S. oil dependency. Guess what? You know, if we only had 140 million people today, guess how much we wouldn't be importing uh, from the Middle East? And guess how much less greenhouse gases there would be in the atmosphere? In other words, have any of you seen anything in the mass media that has pointed out that population size is a major factor in the climate change situation. I, just, just, I wanted to put some numbers in so you'll feel that you've heard a technical seminar. But more important, think about it. If you do the calculations, roughly, roughly 50% of our military expenditures are designed uh, to, uh, to keep control over oil. How you do the calculation depends on uh, what you feel about how much of it is de designed to beat China out in the Caspian Basin. If you think we're building these fancy jet fighters and so on to fight Al-Qaeda, think again. In other words, our military is planning to fight China. Don't forget, their military is planning to fight us too. Uh, because China's running out of oil. I'll go through some of the, there's CENTCOM. And why should the United States have one of its major military areas covering that? Is it because we're desperately interested in saving sand or something? Uh, not clear. I think it must be oil. And there's the Caspian Basin with giant reserves. 
And if you're interested more about resource wars, it's actually something that is not much in the newspapers, but has been very thoroughly discussed in the literature. And here's a good book on it by Michael Clare. And just some historical stuff on the, 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 the Arab-Israeli war in 67. But for tomorrow, place after place, particularly in the Middle East, has got huge population growth, little water, and almost certain fights over it, just like there's going to be so almost certain f more fights after we finish with Iraq and maybe Iran uh, in, the, uh, in the CENTCOM area. And we're going to try and stabilize oil flows. This is the, uh, uh, the techie part of the talk. <laughs> I won't even read you the... Some years ago, Dennis Paragius, a political scientist, and I, in 1972, got an op-ed into the New York Times entitled, uh, What If All the Chinese Got Wheels? At that time, there was 500 million Chinese. Now there are 1.3 billion. How many of you have been to Beijing? Well, I don't need to tell you. <laughs> they don't have any garages, but they sure got cars. This is, this is uh, some computer nut who's wasted huge amounts of my time. That's his little, uh, you know, when, when, when Windows crashes, you can think of uh, uh, the, this guy. All right, what are we going to do about all this? That's, that, that's the end of the light show, and it's really the end of my time, but I'm going to say that it, the situation isn't that we can't do anything about this. What you can say for sure is there are no silver bullets. In other words, if you wanted to change the way we behave, then you're going to have to uh, change the design of our cities. You're going to have to dramatically change our sources of energy and how much we use. We're going to have to make dramatic steps to try and preserve what remains of the biodiversity that's necessary to run our ecosystem services. Uh, it's basically a wedge approach. You've got to do thousands of things that are going to move us in the right direction. Why aren't we doing them? There are lots of reasons besides a total lack of leadership, but we really don't understand many of them. And that's why my own research uh, is going more and more into cultural evolution, because we've got to understand how to change human behavior. Anne and I, with a whole bunch of other people scattered around the world who are interested in it, in fact, I'm going to go talk to the Norwegian government about it in a couple of months, uh, are trying to design not a, another Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. How many of you ever heard of the Millennium Ecosystem Service uh, Assessment? That's interesting. Good. Uh, thousands of scientists got together over the last five, six years to determine what is the state of our life support systems. And you can read their summary paragraph, but if you really want to know and you want to know fast, go into your bathroom. You probably have a porcelain thing on the floor. Lift the lid, look down in, and push the lever, and you'll know what's happening to our life support systems. It's better than the executive summary. Uh, and what we need is a millennium assessment of human behavior, how to get the kind of discussion we're having here tonight, which is unknown to 99% of the people in the world, much more broad, how to get people listening to something besides, uh, have you ever, any of you ever heard of the, of the Fox News channel? There's a very interesting uh, phenomenon in science that's connected with agriculture. Do you all know about uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs? This is where you put 10,000 hogs in a room this size, and outside, you have 50 acres of hog feces fermenting and geysering and eventually breaking through the dam and pouring down the river. So you have this absolute flood of hog feces going down a river. You know what scientists call that? Fox News effect. That's right. <laughs> See, somebody's keeping up with the literature. People have got to understand what's going on, and scientists can't tell them what to do. Scientists can give them a fair idea of what the consequences of various courses will be, but we don't want a world designed by scientists. I know too many of them. But we've got to somehow 
get the discussion going, and I think that's the big challenge for the future, and in part, uh, we got to get the social scientists better organized to help us understand why we do the things we do. If I want to give you some hope, it is that, and I've said this to many audiences, one thing we do know about cultural evolution is it can change with incredible rapidity when the time is ripe. Think about how the Second World War changed the status of minorities in the United States, changed the status of women in the United States. Uh, think how, to a more recent example, none of us, I don't know anybody, including senators and so on, who had any idea that the Soviet Union would break apart and basically communist would end, communism would end over most of the countries. There was, it happened suddenly, we don't understand why. But we do know then that we could change dramatically. We could begin paying real attention to how we treat each other and how we treat our environment. It's possible, we know it can happen. The issue is how do we make it happen? How do we ripen the time for that to happen? You've been very patient, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Mind if I shut this down? <laughs> it's on you. Let's see what happens. <laughs> you said you were gonna, there was uh, some incident you were gonna tell us about um, having to do with consumption that you were gonna keep till the third Oh, hour. oh, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, but of course my mind is gone. Uh, the, uh, uh, I was doing a radio, a, 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 TV blog show for a, a New York Times reporter yesterday, and he says, look, um, is there any reason, to, should we really keep any wilderness at all? In other words, is the existence of Anwar as a relatively undisturbed area, and remember, it's only relatively undisturbed, the whole planet has been disturbed by us, is that a good reason to, um, to keep from drilling for oil there? And I said, I don't care whether Anwar is loaded with wonderful organisms or an absolute destroyed desert, I wouldn't drill for oil there or anywhere else. It's absolutely nuts to be drilling for oil when it's a resource we shouldn't be burning. We should be getting oil by killing our kids and many, many thousands of Iraqis to get oil, a resource we should be phasing away from, is absolutely insane. He he just, he'd never thought of that, you know. Anwar was, do you drill for oil or do you not drill for oil? We're not running out of fossil fuels. You get rid of the oil, we have so much coal, so much tar sand and so on. What we're running out of is environment. We have no place to dump the CO2 and I don't believe most of the plans to sequester it. And they're not going anywhere anyway. So that was the, the incident, the fact that a very knowledgeable person who was very environmental and very friendly had never occurred to him that the idea of a drilling in Anwar is insane because it's drilling, not because of the characteristics of Anwar, which adds to the insanity, of course. Paul, I want to keep you over here in the light. Oh, I'm they, sorry. The camera guys are, you know, their eyes They're are They're going nuts, nuts. yeah, okay. You want me to repeat the... <laughs> yeah, the, the whole riff? talk, actually. Yeah, do the whole yeah. talk. Okay, here's a I question. I have a bad back, too, and I've got to move around. Oh, okay. up and down. Right okay. Here. Robin Sloan, where... <laughs> where's Robin Sloan? Do you Sloan? want to dance? <laughs> Uh, can it wait? <laughs> Question says, okay, let's say we get a president with a larger brain. Easy. Comes into office in January <laughs> and uh, summons Professor Ehrlich to the White House for advice. What's your number one policy priority that you recommend to this person? My, num uh, oh, my number one. Yeah, oh, sorry. What's important and what's achievable? Okay. Well, I think that it's perfectly achievable. The number one priority ought to be to generate uh, the start of a millennium assessment of human behavior. That is, get up and give a speech and say, the most important things in our society are not whether or not gays can get married or whether which starlet happens to be wearing her panties today. There are these issues like survival, food, blah, 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 why we're fighting in Iraq, and we got to start a national discussion of it. In other words, I think because hated as we are overseas, and one of the terrible things, I'm sure many of you travel overseas and know it, is our reputation is, you know, in the dumper. And, but despite that, everybody envies us and looks to us. So if, for example, the president got up and said something really weird, like every economist I know thinks gasoline prices are too low. That's true for me. It's probably true for any economist you run into. Uh, my colleague Larry Goulder, who's chair of our economics department at Stanford now, has spent many years 
trying to answer the following question. If you get rid of the externalities and raise by taxing the, gas, the gasoline price to somewhere in the vicinity, say, of bottled water, uh, that uh, how do you keep the poor people still able to get to work in a society that hasn't yet redesigned its, uh, its cities? And the answer is fairly simple in what's called tax shifting. You, you take the huge revenue that came in from uh, you know, raising the gas tax to say two bucks a gallon, so you're at, uh, gradually, so you're at six or seven dollars a gallon, and you pay down the FICA tax, which is regressive. It's not all that complicated, but if somebody in the US got up, uh, the president got up and said, we gotta find ways to raise the price of gasoline, then you'd know something was happening. Instead of, you, you may not believe this, I know, but let me tell you, I was told that one presidential candidate followed by another said we ought to take the pathetic little gas tax we have off so Americans can burn even more oil and make even more rapid climate change. Now, I, know, I know you don't believe that, but I, I think it can be documented. <laughs> one of those already lost and the other one will. <laughs> um, I hope that's an omen. Yeah, we'll see. You've been talking about cultural ev evolution, but you're actually studying this, as I understand it. That there's something about Polynesian canoes, and I wish you would uh, report what you've got there. Well, scientists like to see if you can get down to some very basic ideas using simple systems. And one of the things that I think you've probably all noticed, and I sort of talked about it here, uh, is that our uh, uh, cultural evolution in the area of technology has been going on extremely rapidly, whereas cultural evolution in areas like ethics hasn't. I mean, it's changed, but if you think about it, if any of your philosophers, a lot of the problems that worried uh, Plato are still worrying us today, okay? Oh, whereas uh, how to feed the camels is not a big issue in our society at the moment. So uh, the issue is, uh, the question that I wanted to answer is, uh, do parts of culture that are tested against the environment evolve more rapidly or more slowly than ones that aren't? Is there a difference? Uh, and one of the problems with understanding cultural evolution, I hate to tell you, is it's extremely hard to get data. Uh, the historians don't keep data. It's very hard to compare things. So I thought we'd go and look at Polynesia. Why would one pick Polynesia as a test system? for the same kind of reasons that one uses Escherichia coli, the gut bacterium, for studying genetics. It's a simple system. Polynesia is simple from the point of view that it's the place where human beings have been the shortest time. Basically, the, the whole invasion took place since, since in, in AD. Uh, and we know the sequence in which the islands were populated pretty well from genetic studies and from, uh, from archaeological studies and so on. And there isn't the problem of mixed migrations going on all the time. There was established the Polynesian societies, and then in the 1700s, there was one European flush that came through and acculturated the whole thing. So I thought, that what, what would I do? I thought I would study, I would take a look. Oh, another advantage. The islands are beautiful and wonderful. Anthropologists aren't dumb. <laughs> and so every anthropologist wanting to get a PhD went out, landed on one of these islands, enjoyed the topless women, uh, and wrote an ethnography. So I thought, OK, we'll, I'll get the ethnographies, and I'll check which changed more rapidly as the islands were invaded. The agricultural techniques, highly tested against the environment, and we know a lot about them and the number of gods, not tested against the environment at all, but presumably we know about them too. It turned out that the ethnographies are written like novels. They'd mention Rango as a god, but they wouldn't mention whether Dango was there too. And they'd say, yeah, they grow this crop, but they wouldn't give proportions of the crops and other ones that weren't there. It turned out to be hopeless to gather the data. Just about to give up, and I found a two-volume um, set of the canoes of Oceania, uh, in which they actually had tables of data. It needed a lot of working, but I got a brilliant graduate student. I, I, we, <laughs> important thing for faculty members to know is you've got to have young graduate students to steal ideas from, first of all. But second of all, this was a woman, is a woman, who we let in at the age of 50. And there was a lot of discussion about whether or not it was fair to her to bring her in to graduate school at the, at the age of 50, which well, turned out to be the best graduate student I've laid eyes on in a long, long time. Completely housebroken. None of the problems that the 23-year-old <laughs> graduate students have. And she 
massage these data, and we were able we were able to compare the structural features of the canoes and how rapidly they changed, uh, and the decorative features of the canoes, which are presumably not really tested against the environment. Well, the interesting thing is when we, when I first started talking to her about, it, I said. Because of that background that I gave you, sort of the overall thing between ethics and thing, I, I said, I suspect that the things tested against the environment will evolve more rapidly because if you're running a cart with a square wheel and somebody comes up with a hexagonal wheel, the square wheel's gone. And then somebody comes up with a octagonal wheel, yeah, and so on. And she said, yeah, but when you get to the round wheel, progress will stop. I, uh, aha. You know, and we actually talked about this a lot and couldn't come to any conclusion. But it turned out that the data in this. Let's ask the audience what their hypothesis oh, yes. okay. is. So this, uh, th think about it for a minute. Which is going to change faster, the elements of culture which are basically forced by the environment, you know, the paddle shape or how the canoe is put together, or things which are pretty much just culture having its own good time, the colors on the canoe, the colors on the paddle, stuff like that. How many think it'll be forced by, uh, the, the changes will mainly come from environmental forcing? All right, maybe a third. How many think it'll uh, just wander around because culture doesn't care? Maybe two thirds. Well, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences now support the latter group. Uh, <laughs> in, in trying to explain this retrospectively, partly Deborah was correct. Mm -hmm. That is, namely, when you get a functional design that works, there, there's uh, less pressure to change it. But the other thing we think, and we haven't, this is pure speculation, is that people like to differentiate themselves. They're not going to differentiate themselves by putting the wings on the airplane straight up so the airplane falls out of the sky. <laughs> They're going to paint it a different color. And so I think there's a tendency to, I, th this is, um, I, let me tell you something else interesting that I didn't really, I remember I saying genetics doesn't explain all this stuff. Uh, one of the reasons we know that genetics doesn't explain our everyday behavior, genetic differences, is for instance the Dione quintuplets, which some of you may remember. These are identically identical, five I, genetically identical little girls who Cloning! were raised, they were literally <laughs> raised in a laboratory, <gasps> literally raised in a laboratory Shame. by a psychologist, and they had completely different life stories. Same thing with Chang and Ang, the, uh, the um, Siamese twins. More cloning. Yeah, one was, a, one was a drunk and the other was sober, <laughs> one was conservative, the other was liberal, and so on. I, I, by the way, I would love to have a sober Siamese twin. Think about it. You share circulation with them, you could drink twice as much before you collapse. I mean, but, and they're yelling in your ear the whole time, yeah, stop right. drinking, right. But having said that, the interesting thing is where do the differences come from? Kids raised in a laboratory with the same genes turn out to be extremely different. Two people who were joined by a band of flesh that big for their entire lives turned out to be entirely different even though they had identical genomes. And we don't know the answer to that except one of the clear reasons is, and, and this is something again that we're trying to look into, is that most of us, including biologists, think, you know, there's some fun, there's ejaculation, there's fertilization, and then nine months later a baby appears, right? Mm -hmm. But it turns out the more we learn, those nine months are filled with all kinds of doses of hormones and the, the, the fetus able to understand, uh, recognize the mother's voice and so on and so forth. I think we're ignoring a huge chunk of human development interpreting the results as being genetic when actually they're environmental but environmental in the womb. Now, there's other things in there too and what triggered me on that is maybe Chang and Ang became so different because nailed together they had the urge to, you know, be, to yeah. individuate to like become more different. Yeah, yeah so, so we don't really know, that, but it shows how ignorant we are of really critical things in human development. Okay, another question on uh, cultural evolution, this one from Kevin Kelly. For some reason he selected his question to hand to me. <laughs> Do you have any evidence that cultural evolution is either predictable or engineerable? And uh, what if aggregate cultural behavior is truly stochastic? Much like uh, uh, if biological evolution. If, if, right? if aggregate, um, Cultural evolution. evolution is truly stochastic, we're screwed. I mean, it's that simple. We, we, we either going to understand, I, I don't think it is. I think 
that you can see all kinds of patterns in history that tell you it's not stochastic. In other words, it's stochastic at one level, just like genetic evolution is often well, stochastic. Well, yeah. what are some of the patterns in genetic evolution that are of the kind of patterns that you would look to find in cultural evolution? Well, in, in genetic evolution, well, it's, it's like we were just talking about with the canoes. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's a form of selection. Mm -hmm. That is, the people who uh, put the canoe together without caulking the seams mm -hmm. drowned. And so that form of making canoes did not, did not get passed on uh, culturally. But if you think about it, there, I, I actually, we have a, a, a nice example uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the book of how in this, uh, between the First and Second World War, all the armies in Europe modernized basically intellectually except the British. The British army was the last army uh, that was basically a peasant levy uh, led by uh, aristocrats. And the requirements of the aristocrats is they had to be neat, clean, smell good, uh, stand upright, and have good manners, but they didn't have to be bright. And as a result, uh, a lot of the British leadership early in the war, particularly in the Desert War, was just horrendous. Uh, and uh, the, they, they, for instance, they are very conservative. They stuck with their regiment. You know, the regiment was the thing in the British Army. And uh, it turned out the regiment was the wrong unit to use in the desert. And the Germans, uh, Rommel, who wasn't so constrained, beat the hell out of them for a while. There was one British general, uh, and you talk about stochasticism, a guy named O'Connor, who was really good. But he ran into a German unit behind his own lines by mistake, was captured. And the British paid a very high price for it. If you look at, I, I, I enjoy looking at military history because I'm, I, I think like most scientists, I think if you want to understand a substance or a system, you want to look at it under stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, war puts human beings in various forms under all kinds of, of stress. I, and one of the places Anne and I visited. So climate change will be good for us because it will put us under stress. Right. I, I won't tell you about Isla Wanda and Rourke's Drift, where we were last week. <laughs> yeah, another, um, another question? You're going to let me go. Yeah, one of the things you've been doing for us is telling us what things to worry about. Uh, and that makes it a uh, <clears throat> tough evening. I also tell you to go out and drink afterwards because you can keep your internal environment in good shape while your external goes down the drain. So. I'll have some of your gin here to see if it helps. Um, a lot of my fellow environmentalists are deeply worried about genetically engineered foods, especially with genetically engineered crops in general. You're an ecologist. This is a bad thing. No, well, first of all, I, I, it, it, blanket condemnation like that is not a good idea. We've been eating genetically engineered crops for thousands of years, uh, and uh, it, we, we're, we, we're lucky they're genetically engineered, because one of the things we do in the engineering, for instance, uh, the ancestors of cucumbers were loaded with cucurbitaceans, which are nasty poisons, and we selected them out so we can eat the cucumbers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, blanket saying it's all good, not necessarily. You stick a peanut gene into a cucumber, and people who have peanut allergy die. So uh, it's like any other technology. It's like the nuclear mm -hmm. arguments. You can't say nuclear power is good or bad. There's some potential good in it. There's some potential bad in it. It all depends in part on who controls it and who deploys it. I mean, it's, it's so, um, I, 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 we are stuck using technology and high technology if we're gonna solve these problems. We're not in a position to go back to hunting and gathering or subsistence agriculture. But we, the system we have for examining the technologies, for the interface between the politics and the technology and so on, is very bad. There shouldn't be a nuclear industry screaming that we've now got to build more nuclear plants. There should, I, the big mistake we made with nukes was uh, that, and it was, it was a good mistake in a sense, the scientists who built the, the atomic bomb felt really guilty. And I think, for, I'm not saying they were guilty, but it was a good reason. If I'd been involved, I probably would have worked on it, but I wouldn't have been thrilled by the results at all. And they wanted to show that actually the work they had done uh, was going to be a huge benefit to humanity. So we were going to have energy too cheap to meet, electricity too cheap to meter, and all that sort of thing. And what we did was instead of carefully designing reactors to produce power, we immediately, because of the situation with the Russians, carefully designed reactors to run submarines. Now, submarines have to be as small as possible to avoid detection. 
And so we got reactors with huge power densities. That is trying to get a huge amount of energy out of a small machine. And almost by definition, if somebody's doing that, you know it's going to be more dangerous than something that's designed uh, to operate safely for a very long time. So we deployed all these submarine reactors, refitted sort of for uh, commercial use, and that led to public relations extravaganzas like Three Mile Island and uh, Chernobyl and so on. So I, the technically skeptical community thinks that you can have safe nuclear power if you do it right. The issue is, can we do it right? Uh, and that's, you know, particularly because you've got to do it right for a very long time. The Atomic Energy Commission guaranteed that it would guard uh, plutonium for something like 10 half-lives uh, to make sure that it was safe, uh, which was, was 500,000 years, I think, they guaranteed to, to sequester the plutonium for 500,000 years. That was two years before the Atomic Energy Commission disappeared. I mean, you, you know, humanity has not got a great record for doing things exactly right, like using the Missouri to shoot aerosols into the atmosphere for the next 10,000 years, and so on. And so, and in fact, uh, Nathan Kiefitz, a very famous demographer, once said, the, the most certain finding of the social sciences is you can count on bad policies badly administered, which tells you you gotta build some buffering into the system. I think that's correct, but it doesn't mean you don't do anything. It means you sort of make the system super fail safe. So, uh, or actually, somebody I hate, um, Dr. Strangelove said, um, uh, what's his name, you know. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, the guy with the, yellow, with the metal leg, I was gonna plug him into a, no, uh, no not von Neumann. Uh, the guy who built the hydrogen bomb. Teller, Teller said, a fool of sufficient magnitude can be found to overwhelm any foolproof system. And I think it's another <laughs> good thing. <laughs> so related to that, then here's a question from Rolf. Where's Rolf? <coughs> okay. Is there a single invention that you've recently witnessed that makes you optimistic about our future? I guess no. And the reason is I don't think there's any single invention that could do it. Okay. If you wanted to ask me if I could just give us an invention that would make our lives a lot simpler, mm -hmm. uh, it would be a cheap, uh, easily disposable in a recycling sense and very um, uh, long-lived battery. Uh, but again, you get into the same kinds of things that you get into with the nuclear power plants. If you imagine you know, a battery this big that will run your car, just imagine how dangerous it's going to be. When you pack that, you know, the laws of thermodynamics are not going to change. And you pack huge amounts of energy into a small space, you better be damn careful about how you're doing it. So it sounds like part of what you're saying about technology is the devil's in the details. That it is, you know, not, you know nuclear or, or genetic engineering, you know, as a whole subject, you don't know yet. You gotta find out, is it a good reactor, bad reactor? Is it the new you, ones, yeah, you don't want to be a Luddite. Trend, I mean, what's the classic example in this area? Better things for better living through chemistry. Remember, the, the freons were developed by, uh, by uh, DuPont, mm -hmm. and it was a marvelous thing. Before the freons, if your refrigerator sprung a leak in the middle of the night, you were dead because the ammonia came out and you were, you were gone. When you switched the freons, you were perfectly safe. The refrigerator sprung a leak, and all it did was your food spoiled. Of course, it could have destroyed civilization, because when we finally found out what was happening to the ozone hole, you know, the life only was able to come out of the oceans 400 million years or so ago because we had an ozone layer that protected us from the UVB. And so there is no such thing as a permanently safe technology. You've got to be watching it all the time, uh, and with the kind of, particularly with the kind of technologies we have to deploy with our kind of society. So it's pointless being a Luddite. We can't survive without really good technologies. And we ought to uh, have very careful ways in which we allow the political system to interact with the technologists. It's, it's a two-way thing that has to be controlled from both ends. The technologists always want to push the envelope. Mm -hmm. I, I remember being in a debate with some uh, British physicists in, a, uh, in London, and we were talking about energy systems, and I was saying, look, you know, one good way to heat water is uh, with solar energy. And they were saying, no, fusion is the way to go. 
And I finally dawned on me why they were saying that. You know, if you heat water by putting a 50-gallon drum on your roof and painting it black and piping cold water into the uh, uh, bottom and uh, into the bottom and taking hot water off the top, that's not very technologically sophisticated. But for fusion, you got to have magnets that are almost absolute zero within feet of uh, of uh, uh, a plasma which is the temperature of the surface of the sun. That's an interesting problem. And the technologists are, I, you can't blame them. I'd be the same way. You always want to push in that direction. But the politicians have to have enough technological knowledge to say, yeah, that's fine. They're there. We're not going to give you the money. We're going to put the 50-gallon drum on the roof. And OK, well, one last question. You're, you're still, you still got ecology students, basically. Some of them are 50-something, which is pretty <laughs> yeah, Right. And all the better. And I guess part of my. You deployed me out to Jasper Ridge, a relatively pristine, relatively pristine area out back of Stanford. Is it fair to wonder what ecologists would be finding if they're focusing on cities now, since we're gonna, we've got to design them better, as you say, if they were focusing on agriculture as ecologists, which we've got to design those systems better so that the ecology isn't hurt by how the agriculture works. Is that going on with your students now? Is it something that should be happening? Both. Uh, I, I don't have any students directly at the moment working on cities, but our entire group has focused basically on what's called countryside biogeography, Ooh, fun. which is, uh, and, and, and the natural capital project that Gretchen Daly is running, which is asking questions like this. How do you design areas already um, very disturbed by human beings in agriculture or something, mm -hmm. so that you can maintain the biodiversity that supplies the pollination services, the, um, the uh, pest control services, and so on. Uh, Gretchen's whole group, which involves a lot of people in finance and so on, is how do you align financial incentives with conservation incentives to preserve the ecosystem services, which are generally not priced. Mm -hmm. And uh, economics plays a huge role. I mean, the last 20 years, the cheeriest thing I can say is that ecologists and economists have come together. My, Larry Goulder is now maybe my closest single colleague, not even our department, chairman of economics. I spend more time working with economists on these issues. We, we published a paper, Gretchen. Did the ecologists uh, go to them or did the economists Both. Come? Really? Well, actually, Partha Dasgupta, an economist, came to Stanford on leave and actually started a lot of it because uh, he hmm. had read eco-science and things mm -hmm. like that. But we, uh, we get along very well. Uh, we see the same problems. And uh, we actually got a paper published with Ken Arrow, who was agreed to be the world's smartest economist, Nobel laureate, as the lead author entitled, uh, are we consuming too much? Gigantic breakthrough, but what we heard was really funny. It's published by the leading economics journal in the United States, and one of the editors said, we heard, that we've got to publish this paper by Ken Arrow and his communist colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. On that note. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.